Hey, welcome to the THC show. Here we are uh, in Vancouver, uh, broadcasting from our uh, Healing Wave Cannabis Substitution Program Low Barrier Access uh, RV. Today on the show, we'll have uh, 8 out of 10 Glenn for the 420 session yeah, come and uh, join us and talk about whatever he wants to talk about. And then uh, Jerry Martin will be here for the Martin Medical Moment. And we'll see what's going on with him and his cases and what else is happening in the world of medical cannabis. And uh, yeah, we're, we're back here in the continuing saga of the pursuit of having a, can a, a cannabis, a community cannabis store. Well, I guess I wish I could rehearse this stuff sometimes, but uh, but yeah, we're you know we're trying to establish that poor people deserve to have access to cannabis uh, as well as rich people, and especially with the overdose epidemic that's going on here, the overdose crisis, uh, so many deaths. Uh, there's been um, oh, what are the statistics on that? Uh, over 18,500 deaths in Canada since the beginning of this epidemic of, of, of tainted drug supply, the fentanyl that's in the drug supply. 6,200 in BC and uh, 1,540 just in Vancouver alone have died from the poison drug supply. And so what we've been trying to establish for the past four years is that people deserve to have access to cannabis, especially in the form of high dose edibles, as an option to uh, to the street drugs that uh, are being consumed, and the governments have been fighting this all along. Uh, they've closed down most of the medical cannabis dispensaries uh, here in Vancouver and other parts of Canada, and those were were lifelines for people that that were trying to use cannabis to offset the use of opioids and other drugs, and to have those taken away. Has, has just worsened the situation horribly. And so when they started to take those away back in 2016, uh, here in Vancouver, the, the city council wanted to regulate the dispensaries that were here uh, prior to legalization in Canada. And part of the, the regulations that they imposed were to take away edibles as being available to people. So at that point, uh, realizing myself how valuable high dose edibles were to help people get off of opioids, I went to city council and appealed to them to you know, allow at least the, the dispensaries that we're going to continue to have high dose edibles available to no avail. <coughs> Excuse me. So we started the cannabis substitution program anyway. Uh, with the support of Van Du, uh, we started this program oh, three and a half plus years ago now. Uh, in fact, it's uh, probably three years and nine months uh, since we started that. For three and a half years, we were at Van Du. Uh, for the last two years there, we were there twice a week, Sundays and Thursdays, giving out care packs of high-dose edibles to people. We had great success with all of that. Um, to the point where the city of Vancouver passed a motion, uh, and also in part thanks to Dr. M.J. Malloy, who released numerous papers based on studying what we were doing. And the City of Vancouver passed this motion to support low barrier access to cannabis. And in response to that, we searched for a storefront. We found one last June and we opened in good faith, believing that the city would support us in our storefront. And, we, and because I had been in contact with Councillor Bly, who put that motion forward uh, since the beginning of, of that motion and that whole journey, and so she was aware that we had found a storefront and city staff was supposed to come and evaluate us and what we were doing. And if it met the community needs in the way that the city council felt it should, then they would support us and, and license us ultimately. But it didn't work out like that. The city licensing came before city staff. City staff has actually never come and evaluated us. But the city licensing, hungry for their $30,000 a year licensing fee that they get from dispensaries, and eager to, to protect those people that pay that amount of money by making sure there's you know, as few as possible other illegal dispensaries, uh, they came after us and our landlord early on to us being in the storefront. I backed them off by contacting the councillor and numerous other people, and we didn't hear any more from city licensing. But our landlord felt that he had no choice through his lawyer that they had to try to evict us. He delayed it as long as he could, took us to court. We had put in a, an application to the federal government under an emergency basis to try to fend off that eviction hearing. 
But the, the federal government remained silent on our request for a, a, a temporary ministerial exemption. Uh, they did uh, let us know that they'd received our application, said that they would try to process it in a timely manner, but still we've heard nothing back from them since. And the situation, of course, uh, took place and, and, and it was a bad outcome. The judge in the case, uh, even though we had asked for an adjournment, a length of time to get our licensing in place, said that we were in court with unclean hands because we had been breaking the Cannabis Act or the criminal law in providing cannabis to poor people to help them get off opioids, uh, which is ludicrous in my mind. How can our hands be considered unclean when we have literally saved numerous lives and we have harmed no one? But that was the judge's opinion and he punished us by giving us seven days to vacate our beautiful storefront, no time to find a new place, and uh, in, in danger of interrupting our program of giving people 420 milligrams every four days that we've been doing for all the length of time we had this storefront and through the care packs at Van Duke, so many of these people, over 250 of them on the program, absolutely rely on us for their 420 milligrams every four days and without them there's great risk that they would have to go back to the poison drug supply and many of them would be at, at serious risk of overdose and death. So we scrambled uh, with that uh, order to vacate in seven days. We've got this RV and uh, here we are in this uh, little RV here. It's 40 years old but it sure suits our purposes. And we're running our low barrier access cannabis substitution program dispensary out of this RV. So, as if that's all not bad enough, after two weeks in the RV, we were raided by the VPD. A week ago Saturday, the VPD uh, pulled up alongside, uh, four of them got out. Uh, ransacked the RV, took most of what we had here, uh, distracted me off to the side, then gave me an ultimatum to drive away or they would impound it. Uh, and me not even knowing that they had taken most of what we had, I decided, and probably for the best anyway, that I drive it away. Uh, figuring full well that they were going to come and arrest me a couple blocks away where there wasn't a bunch of people yelling at them and, uh, and then seize the vehicle, but they didn't. So I drove it to the main police headquarters on Camby Street. I demanded to talk to Deputy Chief Steve Ray, who I've had a relationship with since I first presented this project to the Vancouver Police Board back in November of 2016. And uh, they refused to let me talk to Mr. Ray or any other senior officer. I got to talk to somebody on the other end of a phone in the lobby. They said they'd have somebody in command to talk to me from here. Uh, I then left the police station, I came right back to where we were parked at Maine and Cordova and we quickly reopened and continued to provide the service that we've been providing. Uh, then on the following uh, Tuesday, which was the date of our last show, you, if you watch the show you'll remember that we had been accosted by the parking department, a senior parking person came on behalf of the VPD, told us to leave, wouldn't let me just bark, park in, a, in another stall on the block, said that we weren't allowed to park anywhere on the block anymore. And uh, I drove away, went down a couple blocks down, came back up, he was gone, I parked back here, and we've been here ever since. So what I did the following morning when I got up was I wrote a letter to uh, uh, Vice or Deputy Chief Ray and sent it to him, and I believe that's why we've been uh, not harassed anymore since then. And I'll just share that letter with you. I can find it, I'll send it to you. I'll, I'll read it to you. There it is. Wow, look at that, it's not here. I thought I had it all set up, but this is live TV and it's not as set up as I thought it was, so I'm going to have to uh, find it. Uh, I have it on Facebook because I did post it as well. And maybe I should just go there and get it because I'm not finding it right here. So I'll try that. Just bear with me for a second here and we'll see if we can't uh, figure out what this, where this is here. While you're looking, you, uh, you also wrote another letter to the mayor, didn't you? I did. And the mayor's doing something right now, isn't he? Or pretty close to. Yeah, they're gonna vote on a motion to uh, uh, hopefully decriminalize drug possession of all drugs, um, you know, which is fine, that's great. 
uh, <laughs> it was two years ago that I presented to the mayor holding up a, a care pack of high dose edibles and explaining that that was the real safe supply that people should be able to have at least as an option. Um, but uh, so far we can't get licensed for that. So I sent this one to Mayor Stewart. See if I can go find the one. I'll, and I'll read that one to you as well. I'm going to have a little reading with Neil today. Yeah. But the one to the, the deputy police, I th police I think is important as well. And I do want to share with you, uh, you know, this pursuit of what we're doing here. And, uh, and how we're trying to fend off all of these different forces that are simply uh, acting to protect the... Um, the government monopoly on cannabis. This is all about protecting those stores that are selling cannabis uh, legally. Jeez, this isn't even coming up here very quickly. I can find the one to the mayor. And maybe I'll read that first while, uh, and we'll come back to that other one. I'm not sure. But uh, it was a, a good letter that uh, I think, you know, he responded back to me very nicely. He thanked me for it, said that uh, he was not aware of our circumstance and that he was going to circulate the emails to the different department heads about who we were and who supports us and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, so hopefully he did that. So here's the one I just wrote today to the mayor. At least I can find that one. Uh, good day, sir. I'm Neil Magnuson, founder and director of the Cannabis Substitution Program, Serious Hope Society. We are currently in a crisis with hundreds of vulnerable people who rely on us hanging in the balance. So far, we have not had to interrupt our program, but it has been difficult in the face of our recent eviction from the storefront we were in for four and a half months. Our program ran for three and a half years from Van Du, handing out over 300 care packs of high-dose ed edibles each time, twice a week. Our program has been extremely successful and has been the focus of UBC professor Dr. M.J. Malloy, who's released numerous papers supporting our work. In response to the city unanimously passing the motion to support low barrier access to cannabis to address the overdose crisis June 26, 2019, and keeping Councillor Bly appraised of our actions, we rented a storefront at Maine and Cordova and began providing our program at low barrier access this past June. In good faith that we would be supported, along with our lawyer John Conroy, we put together a very comprehensive application to the Federal Health Minister with an emergency request for a temporary ministerial exemption because our landlord was seeking eviction against his wishes due to a threat from the city licensing department. He did not want to evict us as he understands the good we are doing for the community. Rather than allow us the adjournment while we wait for permission from the federal government, we were evicted by Justice Majawa who said we were in court with unclean hands for supplying unregulated cannabis to help poor people escape addiction to opioids and other street drugs. We have been completely upfront since the beginning while doing everything we can to get licensed. How can our hands be unclean when we are literally saving lives and harming no one? He punished us and gave us seven days to vacate. With no time to find a new space, we quickly got a small RV and have been providing our program from that since parked in front of our vacated store. Ten days ago, we were raided by the VPD for selling unregulated cannabis. They say it's a public safety issue, which is mind-boggling since we have been demonstrating the safety of our local tested and trusted sources, whom we're also trying to get licensed as part of our federal application, for well over three and a half years now. I sent a detailed email to Deputy VPD Chief Steve Ray, and I believe the VPD will no longer hassle us, but I'm unsure of this, and we are still quite concerned about the fragility of our situation. We are now trying our best to find another storefront in the area, while hoping the Federal Health Minister approves us soon. We have many letters of support, including from Professor Zachary Walsh, MJ Malloy, a downtown Eastside psychiatric nurse, and many more. We're also supported by Van Du, OPS, Wars, PHS, and others. The community supports us, and we have been making a huge difference in the lives of the hundreds of people who we've been helping and who rely on us. Perhaps you can help us. We need it. Perhaps there is a city building we could even use for a short time until we find a new home. Perhaps you could encourage the federal government to give us approval. We don't know all that you could help us with, but we would very much appreciate your help. Sincerely, Neil Magnuson. So I'm hoping the mayor helps us. I'm hoping a whole bunch of these people stand up and help us. You know, we've put it out to uh, so many different people of influence in government. 
I called Patty Haydu's office earlier today and left a detailed message for her, hoping that she will quickly authorize some sort of a ministerial exemption, you know, a piece of paper with a signature on it that allows us to continue to do what we're doing and help the people we're helping. But it's been very disgusting that we've had so little help from all levels of government. I've, I've talked to Premier Horgan's office recently as well and got no response back. And, and nobody seems to be doing anything. I called the addictions minister and I called the local MLA's office. Well, I sent an email there. But the local MLA is no longer the local MLA because we just had an election here in BC. And the new MLA hasn't been sworn in yet, so my email was just returned. The call to the health, the, the, the addictions ministry resulted in being told that the new addictions minister also hasn't been sworn in yet, and the office, the, the staff that are now occupying the office don't even know who we are. Certainly we had a good relationship with the previous staff that was there, but it's very difficult, to, you know, because of timing and other things, to, to get anybody, you know, COVID as well is, is certainly hampering our ability to have meetings with people. And it's an excuse being used by the governments to not quickly uh, process our application in the case of the federal government. And it's really, uh, you know, incomprehensible that, uh, that we would be left hanging like this in such a precarious situation when there's literally hundreds and hundreds of people that uh, are relying on us and, and without us, uh, they're going to be in a lot of trouble. And these are very vulnerable people. These are people that, that have, we've attracted here with our efforts on the downtown east side that uh, suffer many barriers, especially that, those of poverty and, and health and mental health and addictions and other things. These are very vulnerable people. And, you know, they're not people that are disposable. And, and they're not people that are just bad people. Uh, as we've come to know so many of the people in this neighborhood that, uh, that we've been helping over these years and come to understand how they got to be down here and, and their plight and the traumas that they've suffered and, and come to quickly understand that that there but for the grace of nature go any one of us, that, uh, that, that we're simply all one or two paychecks away from, from being out of a place to live and spiraling downward. That in most cases with, with drug addiction, these are people that have suffered great trauma in their lives, either as children or, or as adults, that, um, that they've simply tried to cope and do the best that they can. And in a system that, that prohibits the plant medicines that would help them and in a system that, that supports wealthy people and discriminates against poor people, the people that find themselves down and out and suffering uh, have little resources and little recourse as to how to help themselves. They end up spiraling down into this neighborhood and, and neighborhoods like this all across Canada and the United States as well. And they're preyed upon by drug dealers who know that they're just trying to get through another day and, and suffering greatly in that process. And so they should be treated with compassion by our society. They shouldn't be allowed to be used as scapegoats for the interests of big pharma and big oil and, and all those other groups that want to profit off of people and exploit uh, you know, the use of the, these plants that people want to use. And so this is what's been going on for a long time here. This whole situation of homeless drug addicted people you know, sleeping on the street and, and having all of these issues this is all caused by drug prohibition for the most part. Our, our government's wasting billions of our dollars trying to enforce policies of keeping people from using cannabis and these other drugs, but mostly cannabis. They've spent billions of dollars doing that, billions of dollars that could have been used to protect those people that fall through the cracks, that, that can't pay their mortgage once or twice you know, in a, in a couple of months and end up in poverty because of it, or, or end up injured in the workplace and addicted to opioids because that's what the doctors put them on. Apparently it's uh, 419. If I can get back to the right space, oh there it is. We can dismiss that. You got one minute, roll them up. But we really need to treat these people with great compassion. I mean, a society is judged on how it handles the, the, the least able to, to look after themselves. And in this case, our society has bowed to the whims of the corporate agenda of protecting their interests of supplying certain drugs and pro prohibiting other drugs, and especially cannabis. And the cost to our society has been immense. It's incalculable. The millions of lives that have been ruined because of the attempt to prohibit cannabis, the, the millions of lives that would have been enhanced and benefited greatly if they'd have had proper access to cannabis, the, the lies that have been told to us and, and our children, 
the, the corruption that, that runs right through our governments, all of this is, is, is rooted in the desire to protect some corporate interests about what drugs we're allowed to have and not allowed to have. It's twisted, it's perverted, it's turned us into, into slaves and it's caused this world to be upside down, backwards and inside out. And all of this problem that we're trying to address down here with the, the, the opioid overdose crisis and the poverty that's in this neighborhood is all driven by government policies of drug prohibition. Look into it, you'll find out that I'm right. Anyway, that brings us to 420. Uh, 420 on the show is when we have 8 out of 10 Glenn from Canamatch.ca uh, come and sit in with us and uh, help us uh, lighten it up a bit uh, in what, what is otherwise many times a fairly dark show about uh, prohibition and people's ruined lives and things like that. Uh, how are you doing, Glenn? Good, how are you? I'm all right. <laughs> uh, yeah, that mayor, he's gonna, if he gets the approval, he's going to write a letter to the federal government is what he was saying. Who, so who's this? The mayor. The mayor for de oh, the decriminalizing mayor. drugs. Yes. Yeah. So he said if he gets approval from city council tonight, then he has to write a letter to the federal people. Yeah. Yeah. And we, yeah. We, like we, that's never going to do That's like much. you writing a letter, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got my royal resin uh, t-shirt in the mail yesterday. Nice. Yeah. Look at that. There's a. Is that royal blue? Is it yeah. Kind of purple so there's a little leaf on the side. I think. Oh, we, there, got, yeah. we, got, we got no leaf going nope. on there. Oh, there, oh, there, there it is. is. <laughs> it's a new shirt. What do right? you got on the back? Uh, what's it say? It says, high grade is my grade. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> nice. Yeah, they're a group on uh, Facebook. Oh, yeah, and as to Facebook, you guys, I am, I don't know, temporarily blocked or whatever. They, they've sent me a message that they've made a mistake, but I'm still not on block. So right now it says I'm blocked for six days. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so they, they pulled one of my pictures and said it was against community standards. It was a picture of a, of our donations on the table that we did twice a week at Van Du. It was just one random pic from two years ago oh, wow. of, of our donations with my regular, you know, thanks to these people cannabis. for donating. Well, my and, and I so I said I disagreed with that. And they said they were they were low on fact checkers, Ugh. and they'd get back to me. Ugh. Well, they got back to me because I'm thinking, oh my God, if they're gonna pull that out, yeah. and then then how many more thousands of my pictures are gonna come down? But they wrote me back and said they they looked into it and agreed that it was fine, and they put it back up. Well, so really? you know, I I don't know how it's fine. They're, they're just crazy on what they do and don't allow. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, well, uh, hey, this is an adult show. You can show us what you got I, I, banned I, I, for. I'm going to show you, yeah. If I can find it here, let's see. Um, it's probably right here. Yep, there it is. So this is what got me banned. No, no, no weed, no cannabis, no <coughs> sexual boobies. Uh, well, there's no, sexuality. Well, there's just the words are. <laughs> <laughs> Any kid old enough if, to if read does, is going to get a If he doesn't lie, she gets no pleasure. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And one of those strange relationships where it's okay to lie to your wife. I know. So apparently, after that's been passed around so many times, it's it's bad for me. Wow. So, but they have sent me a note that said they've made a mistake, and that I'm not restricted, but I am. What a what a terrible world of censorship that we're moving into here. I know. Hey, Pinocchio you know, and, and what is, who is that? Cinderella. I think that Snow White. Snow White. I bet you it's Snow White. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and if you don't understand no why she wants Snow White if, if you don't understand why she wants <laughs> Pinocchio to lie, then that's fine because you're under twelve years of age. Yeah, and you should be watching. And, and if show. you're over twelve years of age and you get it, well that's fine. That's you know, that's life. That's that's nothing, you know. Yeah. So if you send me a message on Messenger and I don't respond, you know I'm still blocked. I'm not being rude to anybody uh, because I can't respond. You can send oh, me man. you can send me your phone number and I'll text you or call you that way. <laughs> but I can read, but I just can't respond. And, and same with banning all this cannabis content as well. I know. What, the, what is with that? Yeah, well, did you Jen know? get banned or uh, marked because of the sweater? She's got yep. the same thing, right? Yep. Yeah, the sweater got her banned. Why doesn't it get me banned? I mean, and why would it get anybody banned? Like, you must oh be my better looking God. than us. So, yeah, <laughs> we're still dealing with a lot of corruption and, and media control of things, yeah. you know. And algorithms and, and, that and don't know what the fuck's going on. That's another one with us, too, is that we certainly put it out there to all the mainstream media, what was going on with us in, in, our, in our society with hundreds of people relying on us or they might die, and the government corruption that's involved in... Uh, 
you know, in, in trying to prevent us from doing this and not stepping forward and keeping us from being evicted and yeah. not quickly processing our application and recognizing the gravity of this situation. No mainstream media picked up the story no. and, and followed up on it. Why? And when I was like, driving here is it, today... Is it that the corporate interests that are making billions of dollars are hoping to cash in on, on maintaining artificially high post-prohibition prices on weed through a monopoly and a government protection <laughs> racket? Is know. it that those people are also, you know, somehow influencing the media or in control of the media? Maybe. I mean, could it could it go that deep, do you think? that? Uh, I, I sent a letter to uh, Global TV, I saw sent you a screenshot of that, you know. Lots they, of people did, I know they did, yeah. I did too. Yep, yeah, nobody's got to attack on they've never come yet. and talk to us or, no. or followed up in any way. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you'd almost think that there was some sort of a conspiracy amongst the rich people to control the media and to, uh, you know, also have their hands politically into what the police are doing and what, you know, other governments and levels of governments are doing. But, uh, yeah, it seems like there's a lot of corruption going on, oh, there you is. know, yeah. all the way to the top with Trudeau, who lied to my face about his intentions with respect to legalization and got me to support him in that election. And then he brings in a form of legalization that keeps all the people that were in the industry to begin with, that brought Try, it to where it was, keeps them all them. illegal keeps them all criminals, uses even more tax dollars to go after them and, and new enforcement bodies and new laws. Yep. It's just disgusting. It is. It and is. so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. What, what do you got? You got one life, you got one shot. Enjoy yourself. Don't worry about it. Or have some fun trying to make the world a better place because that, that's another option for people. Or try to um, live you know. healthy so you can have lots more fun. Yeah. Right? You know, if you I live healthy. even having fun, right? and that's and what you should be is doing. It's healthy. It's one of the best stuff for you. But it gets, you know, and, and you should be able to just have fun in your life. You should yep. be able to just, you know, find a mate and raise a family and, 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 you know, get a mortgage and buy a place and have fun. You know, you should be able to just do that. <laughs> you should be but, able to. You know, this what we're fighting here is, you know, at, at this level with cannabis is about the wider problem with corruption. Yeah. You know, and the wider problem with corruption, for example, has caused all of this poverty and hardship going on down here with drug addiction and mental health issues and all the rest of it. And all because they're using our money to buy a whole bunch of shit that we don't need or want, like all of this prohibition of cannabis, for example, cost them a whole whack of our money to do all of that. So we don't have enough money to look after families that are struggling, to look after people that might miss a mortgage payment or two, or to help people from falling through the cracks. Our society is lacking in the funds to do all the things that we should and would be able to do if we weren't wasting all this money on trying to prohibit cannabis to protect a bunch of corporations. Hey, you've been here for like three years, right? You, where, well, do where, what do you mean by program? here? Well, just doing your program, because I was thinking like... When yeah, I was February, today, uh, February coming up will be four, four years. years. So like for, for four years, like somebody in two years time could be thinking about their past and how their life is much better because you were down here handing out cannabis. Lots of That's people tell us that. That's about when I was coming in today. The duck could that their people, a lot of people would say, you know, because of that Neil Magnuson guy a couple of years ago handing out cannabis, I am now a better person and not on these opiates. I hear that lots. You hear that, yeah. I hear that yeah. lots, yeah. yeah. People tell me that lots. And I know it's true, you know, and, and we are just trying to help people. Me and my team here, we have an incredible team of people that help, oh, yeah. help out uh, what we're doing here. We just have a couple guys here right now because we're stuck in a little RV. Uh, we had to, uh, you know, we didn't have work for ha half our staff uh, when we got moved out of the store here, so they've gone baking uh, to some degree. But yeah, we're just a skeleton crew with a skeleton amount of what we should have to help people with here. Uh, all, all just because the government's inaction. You know, government action can be very bad. I mean, when they're ruining people's lives by by physically going out and arresting them and breaking into their homes and stealing their, their medicine and their plants and shit. I mean, that kind of government action is very harmful, very bad. But government inaction can also be just as harmful. Oh, yeah. And that's what's going on here, is that they've decided, uh, obviously, in Ottawa, having received our application and an emergency request to treat it as, in, as an urgent matter, um, and and they're, they're falling silent. They're doing nothing about it. They knew we had an eviction date in court and they could have done something to intervene, but they didn't. And now here we are on the streets, uh, you know, susceptible to police, to thieves, to 
the weather to all kinds of different things that are putting great pressure on our ability to help people and they're still remaining silent. The, the, the inaction is criminal in, in my opinion. We need a piece of paper with a signature on it that will allow us to rent a place and do the service that we've been doing for all this time properly. That's all we need. Any public servant with a half an ounce of credibility and ethics should pretty quickly make sure that we get that piece of paper and we get securely into a place where we can do what we do. And yet, you know, here we are, you know, it feels like we're in some epic movie and, and we've been fighting off the these forces for the whole bulk of the movie and now we're we're three quarters of the way through and we're almost down and out and I believe we're gonna come through and we're gonna rise above it all and force and, and get that, you know, that, that and, shot right you know, down in the middle of it and blow up the fucking empire. Yeah yeah we're gonna do it you know <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. but the resistance is just so so hard to take uh, like why are we having to fight for for this which everybody the whole community all of our people within the society and the people that help us we all know that this is great this is wonderful this is what these people need they come and thank us every day they bring tears to my eyes and and we know how much good we're doing any public servant with a half ounce of brains and, and ethics that came here and witnessed what we were doing, they would be supporting us. You know, they would quickly get what we need. You should have a guy from the city come and sit here for a day and hear the stories. Yeah, exactly. Anybody, Justice Majawa, you know, Anybody, you know, yeah. Patty Haydu, John Horgan, somebody come down David here and Secretary. spend a day That's with good. us and yeah. you will be just overwhelmed. You will be in tears. You will be, oh, thank you people so much for what you're doing. This is what this community needs. And this community needs a lot. Oh, so, yes. you know, I, I'm, I'm really upset about, uh, you know, our battle here and what's going on. And, uh, you know, I'm still hopeful. We got serious hope. That's, you know, kind of what we run on. We know we're right. Uh, you know, we can't believe that we can't just get that piece of paper. But, uh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Thank God I get to smoke some weed to calm down a bit, you know. When they want to stonewall you, they can. And yeah. Just raw red tape, more and if they want to the force you out, they can. We found that yeah. out pretty quick when yeah. the BPD were targeting us. Yeah. That if I didn't get that letter written properly to that deputy chief and get some action on the inside of the BPD, then they they would absolutely have forced us out of here. Yeah. yeah. You know they wouldn't allow us to park again. Oh, yeah. No. But now we're okay. You're okay. Yeah, Today we're okay. Issue. Tomorrow, who knows? Who knows? You know, they, they, they haven't contacted me and said, "Okay, you guys are all right there." Uh, they just haven't been back. Yeah. Uh, so I think you know maybe they're having meetings about it. They're talking about us. They're Hopefully. trying to figure it out. And who knows what they will decide? They've got you know? enough for the Christmas party now. Uh, yeah. Five. What was it? Fifty-seven. Oh, they're lying through their teeth. They said they had five thousand seven hundred grams of weed seized off of us. That's a, that's over twelve and a half pounds. Uh, I've never had, I think, more than six pounds since we started this project because, you know, we're always on a shoestring budget here. <laughs> You're always uh, giving it out. Yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're just, you know, living from you know, hand to mouth and, it's, you know, we, we buy it and we sell it and we buy it and we sell it. We're hoping that, you know, we were hoping, we're still hopeful that at some point we'll be far enough ahead of the game that we can buy in large enough quantities that we can be able to get the prices down properly even more. As it is, we're offering, you know, $1 grams of really you know decent weed uh, not anywhere near as decent as our six dollar weed but that's as high as it goes and six dollars a gram is as good as any weed you're gonna find out there better weed than any government store is gonna have and certainly as good as any of the other gray or green market stores are gonna have as well and so you know we've been maintaining all of that but we got hit hard by legal fees for our landlord uh, we got hit hard because we had to go and buy this RV once we got kicked out of that space. Now we get hit hard by the VPD because I don't know what they're trying to do, but they stole all the weed that we had in here and a whole bunch of the edibles that we had for people out of here. And so now we're really trying to operate on a shoestring budget. But, uh, you know, we're, we're making do and, and the program isn't really suffering. We, the, the CSP can always use donations, of course. Um, you know, that's how we run. That's how we always run. Uh, the, the healing wave side is just another mechanism that I put in place to allow for low barrier access and to provide some resources for the cannabis substitution program. And so that's what we're doing here. And in December, but, I'm going to have some socks to give away, you're right? You're doing a sock thing. That's, yeah, I've that's got $500 uh, done up so far, and we might have a Facebook uh, 
promotion or our GoFundMe thing and to get some more um, Cabela's uh, has offered us 40% off and there's five pairs of socks in each bag. Nice. And that's so, all inspired by Professor Sterling. Yes, and, it is. He, and he was the one who contacted the, the people in Abbotsford, told nice. them that they, they, they cooperate in Saskatoon with him. And now Abbotsford is on board. Uh, um, the guy's name is Kevin, and I can't remember. Uh, Elena is the other girl. It's a girl's see. name. But when I go there, I'll get a picture and, and maybe nice. some video and stuff like that. So well, we'll try to raise some more money with the first couple of weeks of December and go pick up some socks and give them out for Christmas time or just before yeah, yeah, and, right. and some dupes. If we can get some holy rollers, rolling some divvies. I think we could provide <laughs> some of that for you too. Yeah, uh, yeah, both in the way of uh, but even some of the donations we could probably That's use it. towards buying some stuff that we can roll too. Yeah, to right. Yeah, yeah. So sure. Yeah. yeah. So you know, very good. It's a wonderful thing, and you know we need to have people oh, helping no. out because people need help, they and these are the times we're in. I mean, they like to say, you know, we're all in this together. Well, we're all in life together, you know. And some of us are better off than others. Some of us are luckier than others. Some of us are unlucky. And, uh, you know, we're all brothers and sisters, and we all just need to help each other. So it's really great that yeah, you're doing that. Well, and, hey, I'm following you know. your example. You know, I'm helping out. I helped out with the Saskatoon one. I gave them $500, too. Nice. Uh, so Sterling had some help for me. So nice. I'm going to do the same thing here. So. Wonderful, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. That's a great project. For well, sure. people and, need uh, socks, especially when it's raining down here, you know? And they've got some good, warm socks, Cabela's. It's, it's not like a dollar store sock or nice. something like that yeah i know you can buy discount. socks uh, 20 bucks or 20 pairs for, for five bucks or i don't know what it is right. that yeah. walmart's got some cheap socks yeah but they're cheap socks yeah right? they're cheap socks and yeah. so people need a little better socks and, and that's, that's awesome the hunting and then camping store so they have nice. really good quality stuff well, good on cabela's for doing that for sure and good yeah. on you for doing that and and everybody else that's helping out and it's christmas time right so even though we all have to isolate and and that kind of stuff the you know, we got to still help people, and there's still lots of ways that we can do that. And of course, if you're helping people, you're the beneficiary. That's how that works. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? that's it. That's it. That's how that and, works. And downtown to side will be your beneficiary of so, Christmas stuff. So, uh, anything else quickly before we wrap up? Oh, Canon Match is doing good. Canon Match. Check out Canon Match. Yeah. You know, I didn't plug AeroFresh, but it's still uh, doing a great job yeah, for us here. Yeah, AeroFresh. AeroFresh can save you from the police if you're driving or not driving, and, and, and you just got had recently smoked a joint while yep. you were sitting somewhere or something like that. If you smell like it or whatever. Aero so free plugs for AeroFresh. I'm yeah. not getting paid for this. I like to promote things that work, and we did find that that worked pretty good. Yeah, so. there it is. Here we go. And there it is right there. AeroFresh.ca. There it goes. Check that out. This stuff really works. Like the cops will not smell cannabis on you at all. <laughs> We've got so many stories now, testimonials. Uh, one guy's worked twice for so far. So, and the other guy was in uh, New Brunswick. And yeah, thank you, Neil. He's always got the. Uh, all right. Well, thanks, Glenn. Go right, trade places with Jerry. Yep. Yeah. So this brings us to the uh, Martin medical moment. Uh, Jerry Martin is our guest, as always, on the show for this segment. Uh, Jerry was a dispensary owner in Whitewood, Saskatchewan uh, before legalization, and he had his dispensary for four years there. But uh, legalization meant that uh, the federal government uh, decided to shut down all the medical dispensaries to protect the interests of the non-medical government stores. It makes no sense, but apparently it makes a lot of money for somebody. So Jerry was asked to close and eventually got raided and shut down and arrested and robbed and uh, properties seized and all the rest of that. And now he's been on a four-year journey to try to sort all that out and get a day in court and maybe get his stuff back or some compensation because uh, really, uh, you know, if the truth wins out and if justice was to prevail, Jerry helped a hell of a lot of people, never hurt nobody. You can't be accused of a crime if you had no intent to hurt people and you didn't hurt nobody. And uh, we'll see what the courts have to say if he ever gets his day in court. But uh, he's still on that journey. That's now past four years since he was raided. So... Um, that's outrageous as well, but uh, Jerry Martin is, uh, is very gracious to come and uh, give us uh, his time and thoughts and uh, insights into what's happening with him every week, and he's with us here again today in the, in the Healing Wave RV. How are you doing, Jerry? Good, and you? Especially my son, my son here, sure. Uh, well, I'm doing all right despite, I guess like yeah. everybody always, doing yeah. all right despite. I'm doing so, awesome. You're doing awesome. I'm awesome. <laughs> well, well, that's good. Yeah. You're better than doing all right despite. Yeah, it yeah, keeps getting better. 
So yeah. what's what's so good these days? Uh, well, I kind of think I secured a license today and yeah. uh, and a lab, man. So I'll be a licensed dealer in the lab. Yeah, we're sorting really? out the details, and then we're a fully independent biopharmaceutical company. And so yeah. you're you're now the head of a biopharmaceutical yeah. company. <laughs> and I'm getting the head of it too. Yeah, it's true. Wow. Yeah. And uh, and so you're going to be putting out what sort of things? What are you going to do? What's oh, the whole uh, idea? Tell us more. Yeah, we're going to be uh, really uh, developing different types of psychedelic drugs uh, to put to market and, uh, and to study with uh, uh, nice. we're gonna be doing different studies uh, you know we haven't really we're not really solid on our first study but you know uh, veterans and PTSD with LSD uh, sounds like a good start maybe right? yeah and you've assembled quite a team yeah quite a team. like, like yeah. some doctors and uh, tell, tell us about your team uh, yeah so I've got uh, dr. Richard Knowles which is vice president he's from Silicon Valley in California uh, kind of the center of the microdosing, uh, you know, epicenter. Nice. Uh, and then I've got Dr. Ira Price out of Toronto. Uh, he's quite famous in the cannabis industry. He's taken the government to court and won uh, uh, on a few, t a couple occasions. And then uh, uh, I think today, I'm not going to mention his name, but there's a doctor out of Toronto today, and uh, that's where we'll secure the lab. Right. And the dealer's license, and then uh, our COO, I still can't quite mention yet either. Right. Uh, but we've also got Dr. Vince Polito out of Australia, which did the world's largest microdosing study ever. Is Jack Lloyd uh, helping you? Yeah, then Jack Lloyd, Paul Lewin, Michael Strogonosis. Uh, right. we've got, yeah, quite a big team uh, building here. Wonderful. So, wonderful. yeah, so we're at the point now uh, once we sign this deal where we can, uh, you know, go big time. And, yeah. yeah. Wonderful stuff. And so back to the other part of your life that's still dragging on, the, the, the quest for a date before a judge yeah. for, for having a medical dispensary. Uh, what's going on with that? You got a date now? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, April 24th to 26th. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll start doing... Uh, right after Virtual 420 next year. Yeah, Virtual 420, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Again, unfortunately, yeah, it's going to be sure. nice to uh, get back to something normal sometime soon. Wouldn't that be nice? I don't yeah. know if that's going to happen ever. Yeah. But yeah, uh, well, so, you're, happen, right? so you're going to go to yeah. court. To, you've got some other co-defendants working with you on that. Yeah, yeah. So we got Pat from Best Buds there, right. and then uh, shout out to Pat. Love you, brother. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and uh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. At Weyburn, I believe it is. Uh, I see. Oh, I can't remember his name. Uh, okay. What are your expectations? Uh, well, it'd be nice to win, as I'm kind of hoping we're going to win now. Um, you know, Paul, Paul made at least some uh, progress with uh, with Sean and Sarah's case with there. With the Sean Howell case and in Alberta. they're appealing that, so it'd be really nice for that appeal kind of game through in favor before the case. But if right. not, we still have uh, some rulings in there that will definitely help with the case. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I don't think I'm probably looking at jail time at this time, but I think it would be really important for us to win this case, not only for uh, the obvious reasons for medical access, uh, but it will certainly help our company as well if we've got another constitutional challenge behind us. Right. So do you get to do your constitutional challenge now no matter what? They can't, like, drop the charges against you and then the, no, then the challenge I'm, would go away? I'm, I'm assuming that they could drop them still. Would that, uh, it doesn't would look that, like that's going to happen, though. Would that end your constitutional challenge if they did yeah, that? I think it would. So. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I think I hope that doesn't happen because I'm looking yeah. forward to the challenge that you're yeah, putting forward. Yeah, it's a long good go. I'd hate to see it just dropped. Because uh, it's all about access uh, for um, you know people through like the barriers that are there with people yeah. trying to access yeah. through. Uh, so they don't have to come to a van. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, storefront. A, a storefront just makes so yeah, much sense, doesn't up, it? I know. Well, they got storefronts, but there's a line up here all day, so obviously something's working. Yeah. Uh, you know. So. Yeah, it just seems you know, so they crazy. Prefer to be outside, wet and cold, lining in a line than in a nice warm store. I mean, there's yeah. drug stores all over the place, yeah. right? It's just it's exactly. so crazy this well, world that we get live that in. Concept of drugs mixed up you they, know? they do there's like two the different drugs, drugs. And, and there's the drug yeah, store yeah. all of those drugs must be good yeah and then there's drugs yeah. <laughs> oh man drugs are drugs bad are drugs <laughs> you know <laughs> Same and with it, alcohol, the people that drink, well, I wouldn't touch us, drugs. Yeah, exactly. Well, you're drinking a drug, man. <laughs> you sure <laughs> you are know, drinking a drug. One of the most drug. dangerous ones on the planet. Yeah, and, and uh, one of the one of the better uh, delivery systems going on too. You yeah. just you know mix it with something sweet yeah. and pop her back. Yeah. You know, put your little cup so, holder and away you go. Here you gotta, here you gotta <laughs> smoke something that makes yeah. you cough or yeah. whatever. Although we eat, yeah. eat cannabis now too. Yeah. But and cannabis drinks even are out yeah. there as well. So. Yeah. Less, but uh, it, it just addictive. you know for twenty four seven. You can go to 
you know, a drug store or even a convenience store or in many cases, even a gas station. If, if your drug of choice is tobacco, for example, yeah. that's a great example, isn't it? That you can go and buy this smoking product that is a carcinogen yeah. that's killing that you know day. over five yeah. million human beings every 12 months die just yeah. from the, the effects of smoking that stuff yet they're worried about the, the efficacy of cannabis right. they're, they're worried about us selling cannabis to people out of the rv because it's a public safety issue because it's unregulated cannabis are you kidding me you can go and buy cigarettes at six different stores in a one block radius here okay, i'm gonna quit those so i'm gonna do iboga on nice. december 37th good for you yeah so we're gonna try you know i already see you as a non-smoker yeah i don't know why but well, i do good, man. so yeah yeah see yourself there too <laughs> well it's hard it's hard sure we're you've been smoking for how long fix that for me how long you've been smoking like almost 40 freaking years wow. <laughs> like a long time how yeah. much do you have you typically smoked in a day what would be a couple, your, a couple packs a day a couple right? packs a yeah. day yeah. wow yeah so it'll be a nice day so it's nice a lot of shoot. money for one thing yeah a lot of money yeah. like 10 bucks a pack now basically is that what? no it's more than that is it yeah i think it's 30 bucks or two packs a thousand bucks a month yeah. Wow! And then you get all the people that need one. Don't you? And, then, and, then, and then you get all the That's cumulative, <laughs> the cumulative effect of the tars and on all yeah, the different well, chemicals. Yeah, it's be nice to be able there. to breathe and not be so controlled by it. It's so controlling for me. For I'm sure, spending eh? four or five hours of my day in the morning, <laughs> like I'm doing my stuff, but I'm on the couch outside just. You to gotta smoke have that it. cigarette smoke, in those yeah. times before yeah. you do your thing. Yeah, I, I mean, the nicotine does help you focus, and I think that's part of the thing for or me. Could be an excuse. Could be an excuse. I don't know because I've never ever. Let's, let's see if I've you're able to do it without a, it. That's I've a good test. I've never been a non-smoker other than under 10 years old, so well, it's hard for me to. Wrap I, I my started head at 10 it. as well. You started at 10, yeah. eh? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's like too. it's like uh, addicts trying to get sober. They just can't wrap their head around that, yeah. right? It's, it's just, such an ingrained you know, habit and going on yeah, for so long. Yeah, can't see past that. So. Yeah, and, and it's involved with just about every aspect of their life as well. It's yeah. associated with smoking yeah. cigarettes or whatever. Entire life is controlled around that habit, and that's what. Oh, you know, man, oh, man. You and I started out on similar paths. Yeah. And at 13, uh, my cousin made the National Hockey League is what happened to me. Yeah. And he sent me equipment that I could use to, to make a team with. And I was out trying yeah. to make a team the first time out on, on the ice. And, man, it felt like there was this steel bar wrapped around <laughs> my chest. And I literally could not <coughs> inhale enough air to be able to do what I needed to do to, to yeah. skate around the rink. And I thought immediately, that's what cigarettes is doing. I've been yeah. smoking for three years by that yeah, time. And I was smoking definitely. a good pack plus a day. And so, yeah, I quit that very day. I never smoked another cigarette again. I smoked a cigar once on a Halloween night and didn't like that very much either. Got pretty dizzy off of that and never smoked them anymore yeah. either. So I got lucky. That's all it was. Yeah. 13 years old. I got a little you know. influence in my life now. So, uh, you know, yeah. that helps a little too. Get a little. Uh, Those you know, things do help a lot. So. Yeah, uh, you Chloe. know, ment <laughs> mentors and, and role models and people that... that Mine's you, three you years want. old. Yeah, well, nah. that's somebody... Who, that, that's a perfect one. Yeah, you yeah know, she's so, awesome. so many people, they get to change their habits when they have kids. Yeah. You know, you get to yeah. kind of relive your life through the, through this child yeah. and, and come to those same places in your life yeah. where you made a decision because of a certain thing. And you can see how that decision could be made but wasn't quite the right decision yeah. i went through all of that when i raised my son yeah well they want to make you better people right so absolutely yeah, my son made me a much better person yeah. as i tried to help him be a good person all right and him and i started this venture of activism together uh, dan had turned 16 and wanted to smoke weed and uh, for me the, the moment that i heard that from him you know, hey, Dad, could I smoke a joint with you? I mean, he knew I smoked weed. Yeah. I didn't know he had started, you know, with a friend of his just right. just shortly before that. But now he decided he wanted to smoke a joint with his dad. And, man, it did not hit me as a good thing, and I knew it should. I knew I should be like, hey, yeah, my son wants to bond with me, yeah. smoke a joint, right? But all I could think about was, oh, fuck, now he's going to be a criminal too. And he's going to have to worry every time the cops are behind him or coming around a corner or, you know, what he's got in his... And all that shit that I, I hated say, so much. Had, uh, I've always had an open door policy with my kids about, about drugs. And they've always been straight and forward with me about them. Uh, some of them gone down, you know, you know, dark paths. It's like their dad did, but they're getting better. And, uh, you know, you know... Just no, Dan and I have always had a great relationship. Yeah. So I didn't hide it from him yeah. at all. Yeah. But I hadn't I attempted. Lots to, of joints with my kids. I hadn't sure. attempted to smoke with him, you know. But at that yeah. moment where he would just turned sixteen, I yeah. hadn't. I hadn't ever decided to hand him a joint or anything. Right. 
uh, and so I was going to wait till he came to me with it. But when right. he did, it it wasn't well, that good moment. Well, smoking weed with mom. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Rest her, so, uh, but yeah, so anyway, that's what uh, that's what really helped shape a lot of uh, of my activism was my son. You know, in me, for me, being in 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 fear or in you know being threatened with a lifetime of being afraid of cops. Yeah. And I I had handled it, but I didn't like it very much. I never liked the label of being a criminal. Yeah. That bothered me a lot. Mm. And then when I really thought about it, uh, shortly after the Herb School days, uh, you know, you're not a criminal. You're not, yeah. you're not a criminal by any yeah. definition. Um, sure, you're you're breaking a law, but that law is laid down by by immoral people who have no business making such a law against people at all. And it doesn't matter if you're only a public servant. You have no business making a law against other people having access to some plant because it might help them with whatever or hurt them with whatever. You have no right to do that if you're a fucking king or a yeah. dictator or a fucking tyrant or a pharaoh yeah, or anything choice. like that. Yeah, freedom, freedom yeah. of choice, freedom of thought. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so once I started wrapping my head around that, I mean, there was no going back for me. This is so wrong and so obvious that if the world doesn't get it, that means the world must be asleep. That means that they must be doing a pretty good job of keeping people distracted and, and misinformed and all the rest well, of do. that. They put a lot of money into that. They uh, do. You know, a lot of, you know, news yeah. uh, helps out with that. They play everything the government wants and... And the government is just a puppet for the corporate elite. I mean, here yeah, we, it's all here we have all, a government. Most of our laws are corp, corporate lobbying. I mean, going back a few hundred years, there wasn't government. There was there was kings. There was yeah. pharaohs. There was yeah. these, these people that were just in charge. Mm. Uh, governments is this thing that's arisen mm. because they're fucking wrong. Mm. You know, being you know, pharaoh doesn't give you the right mm. to, to muddle with your rights and freedoms and, yeah. you know, for thoughts and actions. So because they're wrong... And the more we get together and talk about it and think about it, the, you know, the more we realize they're wrong. So we've overthrown a lot of these people over time, right? Like, right. the people have risen yeah. up and overthrown lots of these dictators and kings yeah, and queens recently, and pharaohs. Even, you know? yeah. Because, you know, they don't have the right to do what they do, but they do it anyway. Yeah. And here we are, you know, we've been granted this dumbocracy of public servants and, uh, you know, but... But it's just gotten so corrupted over the years that people are, are asleep and they don't understand that, that this isn't freedom. This is not a free country. No. And this is not what, what you know our forefathers envisioned when they yeah. thought about what the jail future should be the, like. without the bars. Yeah, kind of jail without the bars. Yeah. This whole thing with, with cannabis legalization, you're paying the fine without going to jail, that's yeah. all. You know, 25 bucks for two joints. Well, it's just a step forward. <laughs> I gotta say. <laughs> it's not good, but, yeah, but it's, it's a but step yeah, forward. Yeah, I guess. You know, yeah. you don't have to go through arrest and search and handcuffs. Well, it depends and, on how much weed you got you know, on you. But, uh, yeah. but, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It depends on what you're trying to do with it. If it's their weed or your weed. Yeah. If you don't got a good answer where you got your weed, and then... I guess yeah. that's going on in some places. We yeah. actually talked about that a little earlier yeah. on the show, about whether or not consumers do get hassled for yeah. having weed on them yeah. that didn't come from the government yeah. because you know not in all provinces there's a challenge going on about that as well now in uh, i think manitoba there's a fellow there what's his name Neil? oh that's uh jesse lavoy jesse lavoy is going to challenge the law in manitoba awesome. restricting home growing uh, already overturned in, in Quebec by another fellow, and I bet you Neil knows his name. That's too. Uh, Yannick Murray Hall. He was on an episode of Hall. Cannabis Culture News Live. The interview is there. Yeah, he awesome. successfully struck it down. Right. Good. Good. Things so yeah, things like that are changing. Uh, Heidi Chartrand is in court tomorrow, nine oh, really? thirty uh, Eastern up, Eastern right? Time, Nova Scotia time, whatever that is. is. Trial or I think it's dinner time around here. Yeah. Um, we'll see. I think she's already uh, had most of that preliminary stuff. So I think she's. I don't know. We should call her and ask her. Yeah. 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 I didn't. I didn't prep her for that, so I'm not going to call her. Right. Out she may or may not be watching. You never know. I wouldn't want to find out she wasn't watching. That wouldn't be fair. You know, everybody watches, right? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so she's in court tomorrow morning. Um, you know, no, stop arresting patients. Hashtag stop arresting patients is what's going on out there. Bring signs if you're in the area. Go and support that stuff. We need to overturn this stuff because it's, it's just horrible what's going on. Um, paying fines for having cannabis was always just a really, really bad thing to begin with. The fact that now they're going to charge you the fine without having you go through all the process 
that's not enough better for me and <laughs> and I hope we can stop that somehow uh, what else is going on you want to promote your websites yeah sure microdelics.ca uh, analog kits uh, 1PLSD 4ACO DMT we've got a few new products coming out too um, and then uh, it's gonna be mindtech.ca the website isn't built yet so nothing's really gonna work on it uh, but if you want to check out the team and the basics of what's going on you can check that out nice nice well good luck with all of that that sounds like an awesome journey yeah. that you're on now it's going good and uh, good luck with the other journey yeah. that you're on as well and we'll yeah. see where that goes and we'll, we'll update it next week again and see what's uh, what's going oh, on. Oh, uh, I brought some... Uh, we were going to do this contest yeah, thing, weren't we? Yeah, yeah. So I finally remembered to bring some kits here. So I got some uh, 4ACO DMT and there's some uh, 1PLSD. You know, I'm going to give these to Glenn. Okay. And Glenn will organize uh, some kind. I'm going to throw another DMT one. There's only one there. There's four LSD kits and uh, we'll figure out some kind of contest. So we are still on that. Oh, well, yeah, That's we're good. on it. Glenn reminded me last week that I think the store kind of interrupted that. So... Yeah, uh, but we're back on track. We're going to keep our promise and give away some kits for sure. Very, very yeah. cool. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks for All everything. Right. We'll see you next week. All right. Have as much fun as you can. See you now. Watch your head. It's a, it's a low barrier access, but it's also a low roof uh, access going on. And uh, yeah, another low one over there. Wow. Oh, dear. So. That's pretty much what's going on this week. Uh, we're we're in limbo. We feel like we're uh, you know hanging on a precipice here, and it's very fragile ground. Uh, we are uh, still maintaining our program uh, out the back of the door. Andrew looks after well. Andrew and George and Jen they all look after it, but Andrew is the master of of the cannabis substitution program. And uh, people come and get their 420 milligrams of high dose edibles every four days. We're still ma maintaining that. For me, that's the bottom line. That's what, what I can't allow to stop. Um, these people have all become uh, known to me. Uh, we care about them. Uh, they trust us, they rely on us. And we have been facilitating their needs with you know, free edibles because they can't afford to buy them and they're not even available anywhere. But these are people with serious needs. These are people that we've come to understand have, have serious health issues have uh, you know issues that the cannabis edibles really helps them with and in many cases with our members it's helped them get right off of those other drugs and and that's a very important thing so we understand how serious it is here that we don't stop what we're doing that when people come to where they know we are where they're expecting to get their 420 for the, for the four days that we need to be here doing that um, it's become difficult to be here doing that, but we're still doing it and I think that uh, that is the bottom line for us one way or the other We can't stop doing that. Uh, I wouldn't sleep at night if we had to stop and uh, You know, I think that's true for most of the people that are helping us here and our donators are so dedicated to helping people And there's so many people besides just the people that we're helping uh, those people uh, that donate to us uh, really have a desire to help and they were looking for ways to help in this serious situation uh, in, in, in several cases there's loved ones and family members that have been lost to the opioid crisis that has motivated the donations and so we need to be here for those people as well to continue to help them uh, have a conduit and a, a way that they can get involved and feel like they're making a difference here and we are making a difference here. We're making a huge difference here. We know it. We see it. It's frustrating that, that there's government forces out there acting against us or not certainly acting with us that don't get it or that are working on some other corrupt agenda of protecting financial interests of people by maintaining artificial prices for the legal cannabis, for example, and for maintaining uh, a prohibition uh, environment for anybody that's outside of the government's monopoly, where they're wasting uh, so many of our precious tax dollars to try to enforce this, this, uh, this corrupt monopoly. I mean, there's no other way to put it. I don't know why it's not completely obvious to everyone that the government is insisting that you use their cannabis that's been, been 
licensed by them to the select few that they decide can do that with regulations imposed on them that rub right against the the the, the understandings of cannabis by the, the master growers and the connoisseurs and those people who understand cannabis know that cannabis that's being consumed by people should not be irradiated it should not be sprayed with these nasty chemicals that uh, are there to kill microbes that there are much better ways to produce cannabis than what the government is doing and on in, in the black market or I don't know I don't like to call it the black market for obvious reasons it's it's a gray market or it's a green market or it's the underground market it's the but free market the free market that marketplace has never had issues with respect to the, the health of people using it uh, 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 impaired or hurt by cannabis. It's just not a thing. Smoking large amounts of cannabis doesn't hurt people. It's not a thing. There's there's no hospital wards filled with people that are suffering from brown lung or some, some thing caused by smoking cannabis. If you're not smoking good cannabis and if you're smoking a lot of uh, swaggy uh, you know, where you got to smoke a lot of flour to get the crystal because there's not much crystal on it or, you know, maybe there is fertilizers and pesticides that haven't been properly flushed or, you know, there are some issues with cannabis, but the worst that you're going to get out of that, unless you have some seriously compromised immune system, but even then, it's more of a myth than a reality I mean, with all the people that I've met and all the people that are using cannabis that have compromised immune systems that not only don't have any trouble, but they have great benefit from using cannabis. But the swaggy weed, lots of it over years can cause chronic bronchitis. Not a great thing to have. Still a medical health issue, but not something to be so worried about as to try to make sure that anybody that's not growing weed that's overseen by the government is considered to be a criminal. There is no damage being caused of any significance or consequence that would result in the people growing or selling cannabis to be considered criminal. I mean, maybe if they're using violence to settle their affairs, they're criminals. Maybe if they're ripping off people and robbing people, they're criminals. But the production and distribution of cannabis harms no one, never has hurt anyone. So to be using the criminal law against people who simply want to grow plants to help other people get plants or to make money, nothing wrong with making money. We all strive to make money. That should be encouraged by governments. It's not the role of government to impede commerce, to stifle commerce, to get in the way of people who have commodities that other people want that they're willing to trade fairly for. That is not the role of government. The role of government is to facilitate commerce, to facilitate interactions and commerce between people. Business is good for us. It's good for the country. There are things that are not correct about the way some businesses are operated. There are things that are that are dangerous about some of the commodities that are being exchanged amongst people. There's where the government has a role to play, to just simply make sure that people are properly educated about the products that they're involved with, to make sure that the industry that's producing them is regulated to, to weed out some of the bad practices that can happen when, when, when companies want to exploit workers. Those sorts of things are the role of government. But the role of government is not to decide what you should and should not have, is not to, to put, be able to put in restrictions and regulations on natural plants. The plants and nature, the cacti, the fungus on this planet do not belong to government. They belong to you and me. They belong to people that are born here, that have a birthright, that, that nobody is in control of once your parents are done raising you when when you arrive here you're you're told that you have to do things and you can't do this and that all by people that brought you here that care for you that that hopefully have your best interests in mind that's how nature provides but once you get to that point where now you say thank you i appreciate uh, you know that you tried to to, to to steer me in the right directions but i don't agree with all of your values i have my own ideas about some things and now i'm going to go be my own person 
when you've reached that stage of development, then nobody ever again gets to tell you you can't do what you want or you, you have to do certain things. Only if you're going to harm other people in the process of doing or not doing those things. Then it becomes other people's business. You can't hurt other people. And we all have a responsibility to not allow other people to be hurt if possible. But if you're not hurting anybody, whatever you choose to do for yourself, whatever you choose to ingest for your own desire to feel differently or, or feed yourself or whatever trip you want to take be it on a boat a plane or on the back of a mushroom or a cap of LSD or whatever you want to do that's nobody's business but yours and if it was anybody's business but yours it would only hopefully be to give you the right information and so public servants have a role to play in some of that by just making sure we have the right information but to restrict it and prohibit it that only increases the demand that only guarantees an unregulated marketplace. If the item that they're trying to prohibit or restrict heavily is dangerous and does pose threats, then the last place that you want to have those things is in an unregulated marketplace. It's the role of the, of the regulators. It's their mandate to make sure that these items that are of potential danger and consequence and harm are not found in an unregulated marketplace. So the regulations and restrictions that have to be put onto these things need to still make it that that's the place where people are going to go to get it. Because that's the safe place, it's not too hard. As soon as it becomes too difficult to get it in an open marketplace, they're going to go underground. So these are just common sense notions and, and ideas that, that we need to really think about because our democracy is in a lot of trouble right now. We are, we are being ruled by people who are supposed to be servants. We have people in authority that are supposed to be there to help us and not be authorities about what we do with our lifestyles. We need to have mechanisms in place that will protect us from those people that we put there as servants to us. Because now we can all see the damage that they can do if they are not properly regulated. We need to properly regulate those public servants that are tasked with helping us. We need to make sure that they're not acting on behalf of corporate interests that want to exploit us and manipulate us for their benefit. We need to have checks and balances in our democracy because without it, it's a dumbocracy without limits on these public servants so that they can't enact and enforce laws against us that completely intrude on our natural rights as human beings. If we don't have mechanisms in place that make them accountable for when they sell us out to corporate interests, which is going on all the time through lobbying behind closed doors, and obviously corporate interests are getting their way with our public servants, we need to have mechanisms in place that protect us from having that happen, that don't allow that to happen, that make it when it does happen that these people are accountable and held accountable properly. We need to have transparency in our public servants. We need to have the ability to watch them on our phones and see what they're doing, if they're doing anything of import, if there's any chance that what they're doing could be corrupted, if there's any chance that what they're doing could be at the great disadvantage of the masses to benefit the few. We need to have transparency in that. It's not hard to do. We're all carrying around phones now. There could be simply just a couple of people paid even minimum wage to hold up a phone and record and live stream what every MP is doing. But it could be even way better than that. We could have real safeguards in place to make sure that we don't miss anything. <coughs> that we get all of that information at our <coughs> fingertips. And any meetings with any corporate lobbyists and our public servants, we get to watch. And then we get to judge and we get to see where there's corruption and where we maybe need some other ways to prevent all of this. We need to rethink our democracy. That's what we need. We need to sit down with smart people and figure out what a public servant should be all about and what governments are intended to be and what role we want them to play in our lives. Because without doing that, 
It's going to continue to evolve the way it's been evolving for decade and generation after decade and generation. And we're going to get more laws from more lawmakers and more corruption and more ways for the corporate world to get at our politicians and get what they want. And we can stop all of that if we have a little bit of a reset. And maybe that's the reset that we should be talking about, is a reset of government, of public servants, of policies, and all of the different things that we as people should expect, as free people should expect from the servants that we are paying to help us. So there's my extended rant for the day. I really hope that we can uh, solve our issues here with respect to uh, getting permission to have a community cannabis store, a low barrier access store where poor people can get access to good cannabis in all of its forms as well. And I hope that we can change it so that we get a, a government that would support and, and act to help that happen rather than act to try to prevent that from happening. And it's all up to us what we do and how we do it. And I hope that uh, we can all uh, we can all do what we need to do because after all, apparently we're all in this together. And if we all act as though it's our, our job and our duty to try to make the world a little bit of a better place as we live here, then maybe we can force these changes down the road. And I only hope that we can. I have serious hope that we can. I hope that all of you have some hope that we can. There are ways to do this. All of you have ideas that none of us have and we need to share those ideas and we need to expand upon those ideas and act upon those ideas and get the job done. And I'll see you next week, but in the meantime we do have other POT TV shows that uh, you can be informed and entertained by. Uh, Mondays is uh, the 420, Health, 420 Lifestyle Show, Carly Marley, BC Bud Gal. Uh, shaking it up and bringing it to you is in the most entertaining way uh, that they can. Always fun to watch. Uh, on Wednesdays, it's Greg Williams with From Under the Influence. Uh, Greg has a very unique perspective after many, many years of, of working in the cannabis activism world. And, uh, and he'll give you a lot of information and insights that you won't get anywhere else, I'm sure. Uh, on Wednesdays... That's Wednesday. That's Thursday. That is Wednesdays. That's why I was stuck. I was going, well, what comes on Wednesday? But that is Wednesdays from Under the Influence. It's Thursday when we have Morning Glory with BC Bud Gal. Somewhere's around 10 a.m. Wake and Bake with the BC Bud Gal. Fridays, uh, Johnny B with How's It Growing. Uh, I'm the sure guest this week, I believe, is Jesse Lavoie. So he'll be discussing Jesse the uh, constitutional challenge in Manitoba. So if you want to know the details. Very good. I'm sure that'll be worth watching, 100%. Saturdays, the high noon is back with Boss Lissa and guests. And uh, Sunday's a day to uh, take off and see what you missed. Next week, uh, I'll be back again with uh, another update in the continuing saga of the quest for the community cannabis store. And, uh, and hopefully you'll join me for that. In the meantime, uh, have a great week. Uh, have as much fun as you can.